It was a misty, rainy evening in May of 1972. Philharmonic Hall in New York City was filled with a star-studded audience. Old friends and colleagues, admirers, critics, who came to this promenade concert because of their admiration and nostalgia for a legend out of the past. Certainly not expecting to be surprised and spellbound by a most enchanting performer whose glamour and artistry still radiated all the qualities of that unique someone we call a star. Into her 70s, at an age when most singers would be content to rest on past laurels, the little nightingale had been persuaded to come out of retirement and sing just once more. In this special concert with her former husband, conductor Andre Kostelanitz. A glimpse into her illustrious career, the homage of her colleagues, her way of life, and most of all, her personal charm, bring to life this portrait of a truly great star, a portrait of the inimitable coloratura soprano and great lady, Lily Pons. Oh. 
This memorable performance was described by one music critic as follows. Not only the sentimental fans, but the would-be cynical critics as well, cheered and smiled and cried and were grateful that little Lily adorned our stage once more as she has always adorned our hearts. Conductor Donald Voorhees. What is the <laughs> Musicologist and author Abram Chasens. Singer Thelma Votipka. And leading baritone Robert Merrill. A short while ago, my wife and I went to hear Lily Pons sing at Philharmonic Hall. And we were astounded. Or actually, I wasn't astounded because I know Lily and her devotion to her singing art was always there. And during the evening, with this magnificent young voice pouring out, I closed my eyes for a while and thought back, reminisced to 1943. When I stood in line, I wasn't, I wasn't in the Met then and never dreamt that I'd get there. I stood in line for seven hours in the rain to hear Lily Pons sing Rosina and the Barber Seville. And I never forgot that performance. I believe that radio had as much to do as any other phase of all of the artists who appeared in it to any uh, degree of frequency because it enabled these top artists whose fees would have been out of range in smaller towns and across the country. It enabled them to come into the people's homes and uh, develop a love for good music. And of course, the more frequent the appearances, the better. In Lily's case, she happened to be the one who appeared most frequently on telephone hour. 50-some odd appearances. The only one who came close to it, of course, was Yasha Heifetz. Lily was a, a, a joy and lots of fun. Everybody loved her. And I remember when I entered to the Metropolitan, she came over very simply to me one evening and she said, would you like to come and have dinner with us tonight? And I said, I'd love to. And she said, look, she's so simple. She said right away, yes. And I thought, my God, it's so marvelous, this great being Lily Pons came over to me and said to me, come and have dinner with me tonight. And I accepted. And I remember her when she came out on, on a platform for concerts. She had the people already in the palm of her hands because she produced that communication that we all talk about, we all have to have. And it remained with me until yesterday. When she came out on the stage to sing yesterday, I was amazed how nothing went away. She's just the same. She had the beauty, she had the taste. She had the feeling that to share with the people.
The day after this memorable reunion, Lily Pons and Andre Kostelanitz reminisced with John Ardwin in Lincoln Center Plaza. How did it feel to work together again? Well, it was an experience that I am sure I and the Philharmonic will remember all their lives. Great joy. How did the idea come about? Well, well <laughs> this is uh, both of us, huh? Well, you know, in Palm Spring, in the winter, we always do a lot of music with uh -huh. a group of friends, uh, Joe Whiteford and uh, Earl Wilde, that great American pianist. He accompanied me all the time. Mm -hmm. And he said, now why you don't sing for the public again? I said, no, I don't <laughs> want to know. I had it. And finally, through the winter, uh, he uh -huh. made a tape. Just for fun. Uh -huh. No, nothing's thinking, you know, uh, yeah. something will happen. And I sent one to Maestro. And what was your reaction? Well, my reaction was super favorable. But uh, this was a very interesting thing. One afternoon, uh, right in this building, I played over this tape to the president of the orchestra, Carlos Mosley, and Frank Melbourne, the head of the press, and Edgar Vinson. But I didn't tell them who was the artist. I said, what do you think of the singer? The singer. <laughs> I said, absolutely wonderful. Well, I say, in this case, I will tell you. It is Lily Pons. Of course, there was an enormous consternation, yeah. jubilation. Yes. And eventually you came here, and we are very happy and very proud that you Thank have you. come to Thank sing you. She never looked like anything except what a prima donna should look like. I never saw the woman when she didn't look exquisitely beautiful. But she wasn't always the dignified diva everybody knew. There was also a pixie side to her personality. And in front of a home movie camera, with family and friends, she showed it. She had a delightful sense of humor and an adventurous nature, always ready to try something new. I'm not afraid ever anything. Uh, the only thing I'm afraid is to go on the stage. <laughs> on the stage, for very special benefits, she could bump and grind with the best of them. To stay in shape, Lily went to ballet classes all her life. When I heard Lily to sing on that beautiful stage of the old Metropolitan, I find the atmosphere was so beautiful. The opera house was so beautiful. And Lily sang so beautiful. Her quality and her staging, her movements, her costumes, they were really great and high class. I was a coloratura too, and I used to sing the same repertoire of Lily, but when I heard her Lucia and her Lacme, I asked the management to cancel those operas from my repertoire because I respect her too much and I thought that I never could compete with her in those operas. Lily Pons was asked once why she still sings and how she can still sing with such a youthful voice and still sing magnificently. Her, 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 her technique is, is just great. Uh, she said, because I never got fat. He said, oh, Madame Pons, but you're never fat. She said, no, I don't mean here, I mean here. She said, my throat never got fat. That's why I could run fast. What she was saying, actually, is the fact that she never sang thick. She never sang with the throat. She never made her voice heavy. It was always light, so she can always run. I think it's a marvelous example for new artists, young people, 
to learn from that. It was a magnificent. I, I, as a matter of fact, I learned from it. And every time I sang, I think about it. If you get fat in the throat, you cannot run fast. And Lily kept it thin all the time, and that's why she could run, and she was agile. It's just a, a marvelous lesson for, for new artists, young people. I'm glad that I was old enough to meet her and to uh, know that there was a time in, in our musical history that was golden, not in the sense that you, you hear people talk of the golden era, because I feel some of that gold was a little brassy. But, um, but in terms of the glamour and the, the atmosphere, the ambiance of, of the opera singer, uh, it's just a different world today, but I think the, that a good part of, of what the people like the Lipons accomplished rubs off on future generations of opera singers. Uh, it certainly had a profound effect. She did have, certainly have a profound effect on my own life. Lily's feelings about the number 13 may well have been prophetic. For on Friday, the 13th of February, 1976, the voice of the little nightingale was stilled. The French newspapers reported, La mort 
de l'oiseau, the death of the bird. But she left us an inspiring memory of a consummate artist and a great lady. <laughs>